Like, why am I chasing this ghost from my past? Because I feel the need, is it the money that I feel like I wanna be able to get back? Is it the, the fame or the attention? Because I never had that and I, I liked it. Was it all the things I could do for my family? Was it all for my ego? Or did I, did I truly love the game anymore? Imagine being a father and just knowing your kids out there doing something and you can't do anything about it. Yeah, and you know, I, my mom always said this to me: "You'll never know until you have one." Right. And now you know. You're like, <laughs> I haven't even had <laughs> one yet. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, but yeah, I guess that I, I, I have a little bit more angst mm -hmm. than I than I've had before. Yeah. Because I have to worry about more than just me. But it's, but it's also cool, a beautiful though. experience, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's cool though. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling that I embrace. Because it's a feeling of parenthood. Mm. There's only one lesson that you could teach your child, soon to be child. You can only teach them one lesson. What would that lesson be, do you think? I think I would work on being consciously aware. Like, I, I don't know if that's a lesson that I can just teach. I think that's more by my actions mm -hmm. and it's more by having conversations with him about things that him or she sees in the world and about why people do the things that they do. Um, and trying to help he or she understand that people make mistakes, but I truly believe that the people that are, there's some people who make mistakes and then put their head down and act like the mistake never happened. I guess a good analogy, there's certain people, there's certain people in life that drive in the dark without their headlights on. Mm -hmm. And it's a choice. They choose to drive in the dark without their headlights on because everybody has the ability to turn your headlights on. You can see what's in front of you if you choose to see. Right. Uh, but I know so many people that come from the perspective of, well, that happened, and you know, I'm just, I got to get over it. So I just I keep myself busy, and I don't take time to assess what currently just happened and how do I grow from that. It's kind of like let me just suppress it, push it into the back burner, move on. Um, and I think that would be the the best trait. Mm -hmm. I think I learned that when I was around 30 years old when I had to write. My book, <laughs> yeah, and it forced me to actually think through why mm -hmm. I did things mm. because I went through a series of steps to get to where I'm at now. Yeah, you know? is there anything you're still suppressing? I think, um, I think at times we're having fully. Yeah, I, I, you know, look, like I said, I'm a work in progress. I, I have. You're not perfect, Jay. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, I still have issues with my father. You know, it mm. was, uh, it was an adjustment for me. You know, we were talking about Scooter before, and every relationship has its own issues. But one of the things I've always appreciated about Irv and about Scott is that they've always had conversations about finances and conversations about worldly things. Now, I am very much appreciative of my father. My father paid for me to go to a private school. He took a train every morning, mm -hmm. 5 a.m. from New Jersey to New York, worked countless hours, had to travel, yeah. worked for Amex for over 20 years, and then AT&T for 10 plus. But we never had those types of conversations. And so when I got drafted and all of a sudden somebody says, here's several million dollars, we've never had any of that type of training mm -hmm. as, a, as a family unit. We never even learned that language, how to communicate to each other with money. Um, well, that's probably 99% of people too. Yeah. And almost every athlete probably. Yes, know. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's also funny because from a business perspective, all of a sudden you, you get all these accolades and you get this attention and then a plethora of people just try to come into your life mm -hmm. because they want to be associated with you business-wise. And it was hard to decipher at that juncture when you're 19, well, who wants to be in business for what I have or who wants to be a business with me, with Jason. And so there was an emotional connection that I brought into, that we all brought into the equation. So then the conversation didn't become, hey, who is the most fiscally conservative? Who's gonna get the best deals? Mm -hmm. Who has the best negotiation power or leverage? It became, who do we feel most comfortable with? And it was, I'm not saying it didn't work out, but those are the little things that you know, when I'm around some of my other friends that grew up in that, you start to realize how they go about negotiating or how they make some of their different business decisions. And for us, 
my dad was the CEO of my company. So my dad had beaten up my mom growing up. Um, there were some drinking issues. I really couldn't do anything about it, right. even though I tried, but obviously the connection between my mother and I became, you know, um, exponentially different mm -hmm. and more in tune with each other. And I could sense her being uneasy or I can sense when um, she would get frustrated and she would lack the language to communicate to my father about what she was feeling like. And now I see how my dad will respond to that lack of language um, and just watch all these different emotional triggers that kicked off. Right. Um, so for me, it was this power play between him and I yeah. because he was the alpha male, but yet think about that role reversal. So at 19, I get all this money and all of a sudden my parents are the CEO and the CMO of my company. They're working for me. I'm the chairman. Yeah. So my dad's been dictating to me from an alpha male perspective about what I'm supposed to do my entire life. But now all of a sudden the power is in my hand, right? So I'm like, I don't want to do that or I want to do this. It was an arduous task. We'll <laughs> leave it at that yeah. because we yeah. and my father had way more experience than I did. And there were certain things where I delegated that responsibility to him. But at the same time, I'm 19, yeah. 20 years old. I'm, I'm a kid. No, no. Yeah. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just, I'm trying to navigate this space. The lifestyle, you get caught into it. You know, I had a girlfriend, but I went to an all boys Catholic high school. Okay. My varsity jacket had, everybody had to get a different nickname on their varsity jacket. Mine said J-Man because I allowed my mom to give me my own nickname. Or like, right, are you right. kidding me? So <laughs> I come from that to all of a sudden the real world where I'm getting attention and I have status and I have money. Um, that's difficult for anybody to navigate, even if you're in your 30s, 40s, yet alone when you're right, 19, right, 20. Right, exactly. So that forced us to bunt heads a lot. Yeah. So when did you start to, so you're still working on the relationship with your father today? You feel like you haven't fully let it go or moved past it? I, I feel like I've let it go, but <laughs> it, never, it never really goes. Yeah, I know. It, um, it always stays and it's, it's my job psychologically to push through it. Yeah. So I, I work on that. Yeah. Um, I'm aware of that. I think having a baby has created another avenue for my father and I to communicate <clears throat> differently. Mm -hmm. So now I can ask him a lot more questions about, well, when you were having me or, you know, how many times did you guys see the doctor with mom? Or did you, did you go through the route that you took multiple times to the hospital? I can ask those type of questions, which allows the dialogue to be different. Yeah. So we don't focus so much on the past, we try to focus more so on the present and the mm -hmm. future, which has been extremely rewarding. That's great. For me. Yeah, it's been rewarding. That's great because it's my dad again. You know, I'm getting my dad. I'm not getting my business partner. He can mentor you as a father. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And a soon-to-be grandfather. Yeah. And yeah. there's there's <clears throat> um, there's nothing at stake. You know, uh, there's our relationship has found a new dimension, which is for me, it's. Uh, it's different because I think I've spent a lot of time around women growing up. Mm. And now to spend more time with my dad, I'm like, oh, okay, like, here's how guys see things. So I know how I see things, but here's how my father sees things. And my father is a little bit more old school. Mm -hmm. um, not that he's not aware, he just, he's old school. Um, you know, we do disagree on one thing though, and it really drives me crazy. I hate when people say, I am who I am. Like mm. this is who I am. Like no, you choose to be this yeah. way. You can, you can evolve and grow, and you can, or you can choose to stay exactly the same, right? And be limited in your perspective. Yeah. Uh, so my dad still will use that line, like you know, I've been putting my time. This is who I am, but he's a he's a good man at heart. He just you know he has flaws, and we all do. Mm. Yeah. What's yeah. the biggest lesson you've learned from him? My, whether whether it's to do or not to yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, when I got hurt, we were forced to go to a therapy session because obviously I was a little bit lost. Right. Um, and I had associated so much of my identity with what I do, which is a common theme for people. Yeah. It's the first question I see so many people ask when involving in a conversation. It's like, oh, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And it's like that, it, you know, you take that for who you are. And uh, so I'm on this identity crisis where I'm on this journey trying to find out who I am without this sport. And a lot of pent up frustration about things that had occurred in the past, um, about things that had happened financially between my father and I. And it was the first time that I tried to address it. Mm. And I haven't always been the most articulate person when it comes to my emotions. I think that just started over the last six or seven years of my life. So I was trying and I was fighting through it. 
And uh, it was the first time I ever heard my father own his mistakes. Wow. Now, I don't know if he's done that to my mother, which is a completely different conversation, but it was, he did it with me. And I think hearing him do that was the first time that I started myself down the road of owning my mistake. Wow. You know, it's, it's funny, I always give a lot of basketball analogies because it's easier for me to understand. Sure. <laughs> um, it's like, you know, my freshman year in college, I was playing for Coach K at Duke and I had never played the point guard position. And he used to always rip me in tape sessions where he would say, you stick to screens like Velcro. Like seriously, refuse to be screened. Refuse to be screened. And every day my freshman year, I'm like, I didn't see the screen coming. My man didn't call out screen. Or he stuck his leg out. Excuse, excuse, mm-hmm. excuse, excuse. And then uh, my sophomore year, it finally clicked for me. I was like, I don't, why am I giving excuses? Oh, that's my way of copping out. That's, that's my way of saying, oh, I couldn't do it or I couldn't make it. Um, what happens if I were to live my life with no excuses? Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I had that on the basketball court. Now that didn't necessarily translate to my life. But when my dad had said that, I was like, oh, okay, so like my accident, like that's my fault. Like that's not because mm. I got, you know, I was friends or I felt alone or my dynamic between my mother and my father and, and myself changed or the lifestyle, um, that's, that's on me. And I think that was the first time I had a real moment with myself. I never had a real, real moment where I sat with myself and I reflected on the series of events that led me to this point in my life mm-hmm. when I was 21 years old. Yeah. And it was a powerful moment. Yeah. Wow. And for those that don't know, you were in a motorcycle accident when you didn't have a license. Is that right? A motorcycle mm-hmm. license. And was it your bike? You bought it or was it a friend's bike or what was the... It was my ego's bike. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was me having, <clears throat> me having money in my pocket and me trying to find some way to express my manhood. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a black and red Yamaha R6. and uh, Fast, huh? Yeah, very fitting too. Same colors <laughs> of the bulls. Um, and it was funny, it almost, it, uh, it correlated with the way I played, right? Like I'm, I'm 6'2", I mean, you're, you're legit. 6'4", six four. Six four. Yeah, yeah, you're legit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bad habit, I can't help it, man. Like I walk in a room, I look at someone, I'm like, mm-hmm, okay. Because I'm used to being in a world where everybody's so much taller than me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like 6'2", like, Amongst common people, it's pretty. It's, it's pretty, pretty tall. It's yeah. pretty good, right? Yeah. I love how you say that in the condescending pretty way. Good. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty decent. Um, hey, so, but you have the back problems. The taller you get, very the true. Lower back, you very know, it's true. harder to stay strong. <laughs> very true. Way to build me up. <laughs> way to build me up. So uh, for me, the bike was like, okay, that was me as a player. Mm-hmm. I'm low to the ground. I'm fast. I was able to take corners or angles differently than players who were taller than me because of my height right. and because of my athleticism. So riding a bike was. It was that, and also gave me an adrenaline rush. You know, um, when you're 20 years old, um, I didn't really know how to properly prioritize my time. I was, I had basketball practice, and then I had free time. Uh And, you know, at the time, business-wise, you're really not making any investments. It's my first year. So you're just letting that accumulate, and your parents are running the business. And uh, so, all that free time led me to things that I shouldn't have been doing. If that's jumping on a plane with a friend and going to Vegas and and partying because you could, or uh, cheating on your girlfriend because you're not used to getting attention from people that have status. Mm -hmm. Or even if it was just little white lies that you would tell because you didn't feel the need to tell people the truth. And also, I felt really alone because the dynamic I came from from in college was so team-oriented it was so family driven. Yeah. Um, whereas I got to the league, it was everybody More individualized, right? Yeah, and everybody had their own family. So after practice, nobody's really hanging out. People go back to their family. You have people vying for contracts, people around the same age range. So mm-hmm. you know, people would kind of sabotage you sometimes on the court. Really? Oh yeah, uh, it was it was a different world for wow. me uh, that I wasn't used to. It wasn't like all for one, one for all, feeling like we're all in this together. Sacrifice no, for the team. And yeah. I, I still, you don't see that today. I mean, right. you, maybe with good, I mean, and I don't know the inner workings of this, but prime example, it's San Antonio Spurs, right? Yeah. They've always been deemed as the family-oriented 
organization within but the league. But look at it right now. Yeah, that's what I'm Kawhi saying. Leonard, so Kawhi like, Leonard, you have a person that kind of takes on, and I don't know the whole story, but yeah. takes on this role of, I need to do what's good for me first. That's a trickle-down effect. Look how that affects a team and the storylines that follows mm -hmm. that narrative. And you start seeing teammates that might say something negative about Kawhi. It just, the dynamic changes. Yeah. So if you have like a multitude of people on one team like that, or you have people that are naturally defiant or, you know, don't go according to team rules, right. it, it leads into itself. Mm -hmm. So my bike was a way for me to get away from all that. It was like my, whoo, I can't figure this out. I just rather ride. And I'd driven bikes before, but it wasn't about me having my license or me riding bikes. It was about, I can do this because I can do this. Like ego is your worst enemy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that led me to the day where I got into a horrific accident. I was leaving my agent's house on my bike. I had to put the bike in neutral. I was cruising fine. I revved it the first time. I was in a desolate area. Don't ask me why I was revving my engine, but for some reason I just got a new muffler. And a, It's cool. It's the ego. It's, it's that. masculine. Yeah, all, yeah. D, all the above, <laughs> right? And uh, rev it the first time. Second time I rev it louder than the second, uh, than the first. Third time I try to rev it louder than the second. In the middle of it, the bike goes click, click. Next thing you know, I'm falling back because the bike has popped a wheelie. Mm. Uh, that old saying, let go, let God. I wish I would have listened to that in that particular moment. But ego again, it was my bike. I just bought this bike. I want to be able to control my destiny. Um, I don't want to prove people correct about all the people that told me the negative aspects of having a bike. So as my momentum is throwing me back, I'm trying to grab onto the handlebars to try to lean forward. As I'm doing that, my momentum is pulling the throttle back even more. The bottom wheel spins out. Mm. Next thing you know, um, I look up. As my eyesight goes from bottom up, I see the speedometer. I'm going like 70 miles per hour. And I see a utility pole and I try to turn the bike at the last second and mm. just clip the whole left side of my body. And uh, end up with my chest on the pavement as if I'm laying on my stomach and my legs are on top of each other as if I'm laying on my side on the grassy knoll area between the curb and the sidewalk. And um, wow. I, tell, I try to tell people all the time, that was the day my life started. That was the day, like I, I started the journey of who I am mm. to this point. It made you slow down. It made you be aware and think about your life. It, it took me through, um, it took me through depression. It took me through anger. It took me through um, addiction to Oxycontin mm -hmm. because I had to. I've had 13 plus surgeries. I still have drop foot to this day. Um, it took me through uh, a psychological awakening. Uh, you know, when you, when you hit bottom and you, even though you're not alone, you, you surround yourself with people that keep you exactly where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know. You, can't, you can choose to surround yourself with people like that. Yes. Or you can choose what you've talked about is having a, an advisory board mm -hmm. of mentors to lift you out of that, which is what you eventually did, right? Yes. So yes. you stayed with the, the bottom of the barrel type of thinking individuals. For, for a while. Drug dealers, the whatever who kept you down there, but then you made a decision to get out of it, right? Eventually, I, I pulled myself yeah. out of it. After a couple suicide attempts and Two. depression and... Two, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I think one of the most humble things that ever happened is, you know, it's not drop foot or it's not the fact that I dislocated my knee, um, you know, or that my, my leg will forever be smaller than my right leg. It's the fact uh, that I kind of dislocated my pelvis and not being able to know if I would be ever able to be erect again and to have a family because of those issues. Mm. Like that was the thing that was really daunting and that, that would send me into a dark spiral, okay. right? And that in conjunction with the fact that I had a recognizable face. And when I was trying to come back, as an athlete, people are used to looking at you with this look of awe, right? Like, oh, you're able to, I'm sure you meet somebody and you're like, I wanna accomplish what Lewis House has been able mm -hmm. to accomplish. Like that look, it, it's rewarding, it's fulfilling. It makes you push harder to be better at what you do. And how that look for me changed to a look of sorrow, a look really? of pity. Will this guy ever be able to come back? And I was also judged for the player I was before, not for the player I was becoming. So to, to live with that 
daunting task of being reminded of who I was every single day, it kept me in the past with who I was. It didn't allow me to move forward and think about who I wanted to be now in this current state. Yeah. Um, so after you know trying to come back and play, uh, it didn't really work out with the Nets. I'm like 25 now. I've been going through physical therapy for two and a half, three years. Did you get back on the court for a little bit? Yeah, I did. I, I was able to get back on in the, the court. League. In the league, I played for the Nets for a short stint, then I got cut, and then I went down to the D-League. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> I got cut. I was gonna try to go overseas and play. Was working out by myself, dislocated my right ankle, my mm. healthy leg. Oh my uh, I had to go back down to Durham to do more physical therapy, and then went to the D-League, played there, played one game, almost had a triple-double, pulled my hamstring off my left leg, oh, popped off the bone. Yeah, it gets, oh, it, gets it gets so good. It just, it's just it's great. It just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper, right? The game didn't want you to play. No, it did not. Somebody <laughs> was saying, signs, Stop. pay attention Here. to me. Um, oh, man. And then I went back to North Carolina to do more physical therapy, and I got a call from my teammate that my coach, Dennis Johnson, that played for the Boston Celtics, played with Larry Bird and Robert mm -hmm. Parrish, who's an iconic figure for the Celtics, was my head coach, and he had prayed with me in the hospital. Um, not really big into prayer at that particular time, but you know, I had been in the hospital so much, he's like, you know, I want you to know that you have such a bigger purpose, and you're gonna come back, and you're gonna play this game way better than you ever played before. And we have somebody that kind of leaves that, that mark on you, that he still believed in me, it kept me, it kept my adrenaline up, it kept me, it, it filled my tank to fight more to continue mm. to play. And then when I came home, I got a call from a teammate that he was playing one-on-one. -on -one. It's about a week and a half later after I'd been home. And um, he passed away from a heart attack. And um, I was distraught. I was like, mm. man, this guy that just prayed with me a week, a week prior. Seemed healthy. Seemed great, was okay. His son was always around. Like, and he just, DJ just passed away from a heart attack. And I remember thinking for the first time in my life, like, what, like, what, what am I doing? Like, that could have been me four and a half, five years ago. Like, why am I chasing this ghost from my past? Because I feel the need, is it the money that I feel like I wanna be able to get back? Is it the, the fame or the attention? Because I never had that and I, I liked it. Um, was it all the things I could do for my family? Was it all for my ego? Or did I, did I truly love the game anymore? And the answer to that last question was no. Mm. I didn't. I didn't love the game because I couldn't play the game the way I saw the game. You know, it's in your mind. You knew you wanted to make a move, oh, but you couldn't do it. It's debilitating, man. It's the worst. It's like me playing last weekend against the old guys. <laughs> the old guys. And me fumbling the balls in the lane when I'm like, I used to be able to do this, do this. so well. Yeah. Um, and for me, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to start trying to work on me. Now, mm. I still was taking Oxycontin every single day because I had nerve regeneration. Yeah. I dislocated my nerve. You're and in pain. Yeah. yeah, and nerve regeneration is like childbirth. It feels like somebody's stabbing oh. you every single day and it could last for a minute or it could last for five hours. So, you know, I still had a journey to fight that, but it was the first time I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to start the process of letting basketball go wow. and hard. start trying to figure out like who, who Jason Williams is. Wow. No, I was like part of it. It's amazing. <clears throat> the more I learn, hear from about from you, and the more I realize we have a lot of things in, in common uh, with domestic violence and things like that from our fathers, and uh, also losing our identities. I played professional football for a little bit, I about a season and a half. Yeah. Got injured, and I had to retire because I was in a cast, recovering for six months. And for me, it was so hard to let it go. You know, for years afterwards, I kept thinking about trying to come back, but I knew I wouldn't be able to play at the highest level. And so I didn't want to play at all if I had to play, you know, a level below. Hmm. But every year I'd watch the NFL and I'd see like I practiced with that guy, I played against that guy. Like I see them growing, I see how much they're making. And I know you talked about this as well. Seeing guys get hundred million dollar contracts, you know, five, ten years after you were done. <clears throat> and it's hard to let it go, I think, sometimes. That identity that I used to be this basketball player or this football player and now I'm no longer. And I honestly I don't know if you did this, but you know, I guess having that year with that lifestyle, I always found myself in, in, in conflicting moments, right, throughout that journey. If it was seeing a player kiss his wife and kiss his kids mm -hmm. and then jump on a plane and then we party until four o'clock in the morning. And he's cheating on his wife. And he's cheating on his wife and he's <clears throat> bringing you know, girls home to his hotel and then we play in the game 
And then the next night we go to Toronto and the same thing happens again. And then we get off the plane and he kisses his wife and his kids like it never happened. And I'm like, oh man, like this is, this is real. And you almost start seeing how you can live in false realities, right? right? Like your perception is warped across the board because you have a lot of people on your team that tell you yes. And people are afraid to tell you no because your morals, mm -hmm. you know, inevitably they get pushed. Um, so I, I think for me, I was, I was really angry too because I was like, wait, I didn't cheat on my wife or, you know, um, I always try to show up to practice early or every charity event I try to be there or, you know, the kids, there were kids that played drums outside my apartment every morning in Chicago and it was freezing and I would get per diem. I'm like, what can I do with all this per, per diem money? Like, I'm already making great money. I would right. give it to the kids yeah, yeah. and they could see their faces, right? Like, I've done all these different things, you know, why me? And it's, um, I'll never forget this, man. This is like three or four years after my accident and I'm in New York City and I just kind of done my second attempt at suicide. I had taken a lot of Oxycontin pills and I drank a lot. And I was finally starting this area where I was starting to develop my board after I woke up, which I didn't think I Your deserved. Personal, personal advisory my personal board. advisory board. Because yeah. I started thinking like every company, every powerful <laughs> company has a board. And it's the board's job you know, meet quarterly and every CEO I know, his palms are always sweaty. He's always nervous with the prep that goes into this <laughs> yeah. because that board's going to evaluate you the first quarter. And it's their job to take you through where the company was, where the company currently is, and where the company is going to go. And if you're the guy steering that ship or the woman steering that ship, you're responsible. We want to see you own up to that. So I was like, why am I not valuing myself like a company? How can I surround myself mm -hmm. with different people and different verticals that can help me be better? And my dad really confirmed it. My dad was like, you know what? I used to hear you always talk about why me, why me? And he was like, why not you? Mm. Maybe your shoulders are broad enough to carry this weight. And it was the first time I've ever heard somebody say that. And it just, mm. it just changed me. Now I still had a lot of work to do, but I started right. to attack the game with a different blueprint. Because now things that went wrong I felt like there was purpose in them going wrong or things that didn't go my way. I had to find a silver lining and why they didn't go my mm -hmm. way. Maybe that wasn't meant to be part of my path. And it was one of the most empowerful, like empowering things I've ever heard or done because I just use all everything that happens in my life as fuel for where I'm going instead of being angry or holding resentment for right. what didn't occur. Yeah, I think we have a choice of, you know, things happened to us, for us, whatever we want to look at it. And if we hold on to it as a victim, then we're always going to be held back. But if we look at it, like you said, like life is no accidents, it's a purpose, then something greater can come from it, which is what you've been able to do. You've been able to inspire so many people through your journey now and also evolve as a human being, as a man and a human being. And I think it's been a beautiful thing to watch for the last you know, 15 years, I guess, since that accident, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's required me to <laughs> really dig deep within myself, <laughs> which is... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always a work in progress, but it's rewarding. <clears throat> yeah, it's very rewarding. There's, there's power in, in telling your truth. Mm, absolutely. You know, and also recognizing that your truth is based upon your experiences, but that doesn't mean that Jay Williams' truth is Lewis Howe's truth. Absolutely. But I love finding that common ground. I love, and I, it, it's funny because I, I don't, you know, my job on TV is to debate. And, you know, you get a chance to see guys like Stephen A. Smith debate. He's and, hilarious. Oh, God. He's, he's so opinionated. He's so flamboyant sometimes oh with his delivery. Yeah. And it's funny because I, I would never say somebody's wrong. Like, I would never be like, you're wrong. Like, your truth is your truth. Now, mm -hmm. if you're willing to find middle ground and maybe let your truth evolve, that's different. Right? So, for me, I also feel like when I have time to have conversations with people you know obviously now I'm talking because you're asking me to talk but I don't usually do a lot of the talking mm -hmm. I usually like to ask questions because I feel like I can learn something from everybody man like I watched a lot of your stuff and seen things you've done with Scott seen things you've done on Ellen seen things you've done with a lot of other people and I always feel like I walk away learning something about myself from yeah. other people's experiences that Absolutely. I can incorporate into my life yeah and so I, I think Venturing into life with that kind of vision is way different than I used to be before because I used to be myopic. I used mm -hmm. to just focus on what Jason had to focus on. 
and that was it. Right. And now that web has expanded. Yeah, one of the reasons I love this podcast or just having a platform in general is I get the opportunity to ask questions. Because for me, I feel like if I'm saying anything, speaking, I'm not learning. Hmm. And I want to grow into the best version of myself and get better every single day. And I know I need to dig deeper into the right questions for different people. Hmm. And that's how I continue to, to grow. But if I have you on this show and I'm talking the whole time, I'm not learning a thing. Agreed. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. So I'm glad you have that same perspective. I want to go back into advisory board because this is the second time it's come up in the last month for me that another really successful guest I had on, his name is Ed Milet. He, I asked him a question. Um, <clears throat> we were having sushi one day and I asked him a question. I said, you know, if you're me again, if you're my age again, he's a little bit older than me now, I go, you know, what would you really focus on to get to the next level? I'm always asking guys or girls who are older and more experienced and, and wiser mm -hmm. what they would do if they were me or in my position. Uh, you know, what's the one thing I could do to get better? He said, get a personal advisory board. And so you're the second person to bring this up in mm -hmm. the last month. It's just kind of come to the surface. And it's funny, in my first book, I write about having a personal advisory board when I was 25 going through transition. When I got injured, I found a personal advisory board and that's really what helped me get to the next level. I kind of lost having that. I think because the podcast, I have so many mentors. You know, I can mm. kind of call on anyone at any time mm -hmm. and be like, hey, can you give me <clears throat> feedback? But I really believe that having a group of three to five people that have done things that you want to do, who have gone through similar experiences, and who are just older and wiser, to have them in your corner is really important. But to create almost like a formal agreement. It doesn't have to be too formal. But just like an arrangement between each other, like, hey, I would love to be able to call on you once a quarter and ask for feedback on how I can improve. Hmm. And I think that's a good lesson. I'm glad you reminded me of this because it's something I wanted to get back into. It's really having like five to six core people in my corner that I can call on, you know, whether it be for a year or two year period, but just a board. And people could come and go, but always having that kind of core group of people that you're inspired by. And do you still have that now? I do. Yeah. I, I have... Uh... I have multiple boards, which is really cool. Um, for like personal life or business? Or well, I have, I have a business board. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm slowly developing a father board. Yeah. Of like one or two guys that uh, I really just have learned to appreciate with their patience in which they have with their kids um, and how they push their kids to think. Um, it's, um, but you, you, Lewis, you just did something that I don't see a lot of people do. Like, you know, in our jobs, we're constantly interacting with people. And I, I think my fiance finally sees this after two and, a year, two and a half years of being together, is that sometimes I'm mentally drained because like, this takes a lot out of somebody. A lot. Like yeah. I'm, I'm emotionally, I'm with you. Like we're <laughs> to be present for an hour. Yeah, and we're on this journey. journey. And then to walk away and you know, if I'm walking down the street and somebody say, oh, hey, Jay, I remember blah, blah. Like I like to give people my attention because I also, had been pushed to the side by people when I was growing up. And I recognize how powerful that is. Um, but, but it's a lot of energy. It does. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I've recognized that I don't see a lot of people do that you just said while you were talking about this is, I don't find a lot of people are vulnerable enough to ask for help, mm -hmm. right? So, and I've also found that the more vulnerable I am with these people on my board, the more willing they are to be 100% all in. Like I have a guy on my board named Charlie Grantham and he ran the Players Union mm -hmm. when it first kind of got established before Billy Hunter took over. And this year has been a crazy year for me, right? I've been, I just told you about my schedule, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday with the wife and <laughs> like, you know, we have calls and sometimes with my travel schedule, I can't make the call. He will not let me not speak with him per week. Wow. He will not let Once it happen. A week. Once a week we talk. He will not let it happen. He will call me and I'm like, Charlie, I'm on the plane, can't pick up. And then, you know, obviously you ever land after a three hour plane ride, you have 30 emails in the inbox and I have to get something to work and I have another call I need to do for radio and you just get lost in your day and you're like, yeah. I should have called Charlie. And then sure enough, when I think that he's like, hey, I'm open for a call, can you call? Like, so I have people who are also yeah. relentless in their approach to connect with me, which I appreciate. And I, I have people that I have to be relentless to with as well, <laughs> right? So I, I see that. Um, but it holds me to a standard higher than what I hold myself to at that given time when I first started my board. 
and I like having high standards. Yeah. I, I You're like, an athlete. You train. You know. I you don't know like. any other way to be. Yeah. And so, you know, we always get put in these compromising positions where, you know, you can compromise yourself at times. But knowing that I'm able to slow down the matrix of life, you know, like it's like being a point guard. My freshman year, the game was happening at 8,000 miles per hour. Yeah. Right? Because I wasn't flexing that muscle to think about time and situation, what is Coach K saying, where's Mike Dunleavy, is Shane Batty in the right position on the floor, Carlos Boozer hasn't gotten to touch the past two possessions, Mike just went off for 15 points in a row, we should probably run a play to get Mike the ball again, right. hey, TV time, time, TV timeout's coming <laughs> in four minutes, right? Like my freshman year, I yeah. couldn't process all that because I wasn't flexing that muscle. The more and more I studied, all of a sudden I got to my sophomore year, hey, calm down, we still got 24 seconds on the shot clock. Hey, Shane, come here, hey, we got, you know, another minute into the TV timeout. Take your time, guys. Gather yeah. your breath. Here's what the play is. And I feel like that's the same way I think about my life now. I wasn't used to flexing that muscle, but the more I flexed it about, hey, I have to call my board. Um, hey, they're going to ask me piercing questions where I may not know the answer, but it's my job to go back and sit and think about it mm -hmm. and then go back to them and think they early through that. Or with my wife, she pushes me. She drives me to be better. Um, it just, all of a sudden now the matrix has slowed down a little bit. I, yeah. I look forward to when it slows down even more. But it, it's a cool experience when you work on that. Yeah. It's I'm, different. I'm sure Tom Billier would love you talking about the matrix. The New York TV, show. He's yeah. a good guy. Um, let's talk about athletes who are great at transitioning from sport to business or just life after. And a majority of them that seem like they're not good at it. You've been one who has been good at transitioning and building a career and a business and a brand for yourself, but it seems like most of them become shells of themselves and don't know how to escape their past identity. Why is that? Why are some able to transition and why does it seem to me like 80, 90% are unwilling, are unable to grow past it? I, I think some of the ones that I've seen that have been able to successfully transition out of it is that they recognize that it, it is a business so they try to use their platform to diversify themselves as much as possible yeah. while they have that leverage. Um, you know, Ray Allen used to talk to me about this all the time where he would say, hey, you know, who are the five most powerful CEOs in Chicago? And I don't, I don't know, Ray, I'm 19 <laughs> years old. I, I want to go hang out at the club, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he'd be like, well, why don't you do some research on it? You know, you get courtside seats to all these different games that you play at. Why don't you invite, hmm. you know, a CEO? Interesting. Um, because you want to run your own business one day, correct? Yes. Oh, okay. I am a business. Why would I surround myself with different business people, right? Um, so I think some athletes get it. But it's also, it's challenging, Lewis. And I, I go back to this whole thing about what was the infrastructure in which you were raised. Right. Yeah. You know, you... Um, we're not taught about money. We're not taught about what's after. Fame. Yeah. You're not talking about fame. And I'll tell you what else fame will do to you. Fame will force you to become extremely introverted. Mm -hmm. Because... If you have a lot of friends, I, prime example, my own family, and I, middle class family, my dad and mom did okay. My dad was one of, you know, 10 plus brothers and sisters. What it did to us was all of a sudden you get money, you have a lot of people within your own family structure that see that as we have money. Entitled. Yeah. Oprah talks about this. We made it. I don't know if you, you I Oprah, had, Oprah had this incredible interview on a podcast, I'll send it to you. Where she said, because she didn't have a lot of money growing up, and then she all of a sudden became famous and tons of money, and everyone wanted money, and it was never enough. And she would help sometimes, and she eventually got fed up with everyone asking her for money, that she threw a huge dinner celebration, and she invited the whole family. Hmm. Extended cousins, like nephews and nieces, like great aunts and uncles, like people she didn't even know, and brought them all there. And she threw the best feast of their life. And she gave cars to people and houses and cash to some people. She gave whatever she felt like she wanted to give. And she said, never ask for money from me again because I'm never going to give it to you. Wow. Unless I want to. But don't ask me. And she said people were still complaining. Like, you only got me one house. I should have got two. You only gave me a car. That person got this. You only gave me two grand. I should have got ten grand. And people were still ungrateful. Hmm. I think it's a challenge. I didn't want to cut you off. No, there, no, but no. It's just please. like I love that going from not having money to then having it. You said that everyone, like we have it now, like everyone feels entitled, right? Hmm. What was that like then for you? It was, it was like trying to feed somebody who had an insatiable appetite. Just 
it's never going to be done. Um, and it, it was weird too because there was that um, you feel an emotional connection, you know, when you know, I don't know how, how you are with this, but when you even when you go out to dinner with friends, you know, you're with seven or eight friends, and some of my friends had never been to Ruth Chris, right, or you know, some of these really great restaurants, Michael like, Jordan Steakhouse, yeah, hey. you know, and <laughs> when you go, you, you see people and. Once again, like, I haven't always been aware, but I, I think I've always had maybe the, the gift of being aware because I would catch on little things. They'd just be fragmented mm. throughout my journey. And I would see people and see people's eyes when they would look at the menu and they would see, oh, filet mignon or, you know, whatever, the lobster. And they're like, oh, I want to get the lobster. And then they look across and you see, you see the price. $80. Yeah, like, hey, hey, $90. <laughs> and people are like, I can't afford mm -hmm. that. So what does that lead to? I got it. Yeah. You know, because I, I want to treat you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that creates a repetitive habit. That be, that creates a, a bad direction because what happens is you always become that person. Right. Where wherever you go, and, and the fame part of it too, and I would see athletes go through this all the time where, you know, can you imagine Dwayne Wade going through the airport at Miami Dade? He will be. Or LeBron and Cleveland. Or LeBron. Yeah. Be hassled right now. Yeah. That's at the high end of the spectrum, okay? LeBron or D-Wade. But the problem is you're talking about people who have, everybody has an ego. Their ego has driven them to get to this point. Regardless of whether you call the 15th guy on the roster a bum, he's still point. He's still part of .001% of the world. And he's making money and he's... Yeah. Millions of dollars to play a sport that <laughs> yeah. you go, you know, weekend warriors, we fight to play, right? <laughs> um, so there's an ego associated with that. So certain guys, it's always about keeping up with the Joneses. You don't want to go through the airport if you, you know, mm -hmm. have to sign autographs, even if you're a mid-tier guy. So all of a sudden that, you know, that's $3,000 you're spending for three first class seats, mm -hmm. that easily becomes $40,000 for a one way on a private jet. Right. So that lifestyle keeps up. And, but you're making absurd money. So all of a sudden when that money stops coming in, you've had years and years and years of living this lifestyle. You think somebody's just gonna be able to turn it on this, uh, flip of a switch like that and just stop and all of a sudden be conservative? Mm. No, you continue to live that lifestyle. Um, so it's it, those kind of principles which makes it difficult for people to reinsert themselves yeah. back into society, especially when they haven't been around society for that eight, that 10 year stint that they've been professional athletes. Right, everything's been taken care of. You've been on team buses or private yes, jets. People. And, yeah, all the way around from your accountants yeah. to your financial advisors to your agents, because people are also afraid to lose you as a client. Mm -hmm. And then if you do run into that person that is strong enough to say, no, you're wrong, hopefully, you're lucky enough if you're that person that says no, you're wrong, that they keep you on board. But a lot of times you're like, oh, okay, I'm wrong, you're fired. See you. Yeah, exactly. You're fired. I'll bring somebody else on board who will tell me what I want to hear. Right. And will yeah. give me the blueprint on how I want to get to where I want to be. Yeah. So it, it's hard <laughs> to just turn the corner on something like that when that's been your habit. How do you feel like you were able to turn the corner and build the career you've you know had, write the book, and do everything you've done? I didn't. I had a taste of the lifestyle. I didn't have a long yeah. stay. You had a year, year and a half, right? Or it's like, yeah, I, I had a, I had a one night stay at the Four Seasons. I didn't live there for a <laughs> week and a half. Right. You know. Um, so, for me, yeah, we, I had money, um, and that was still, that was still difficult in navigating that space with my father, uh, even after I got hurt because he remained on the payroll, and there were some issues there that I had to fight through with him, which was, you, yeah. But you yeah. have guaranteed money, right? Guaranteed money. Yeah. Guaranteed no money. What, no for injury. my first year. Um, but then my second year, my contract could have been voided by the league. They paid me half of my second year. Because you violated because the, ter or the, the terms motorcycle. of the agreement, yeah. yes, which is like a motorcycle going in the car above 100 miles per hour, jet skiing, mm -hmm. skydiving, yeah. all the stuff that. Half. Oh, yeah. That's they still gave me half, which was incredible. That's amazing. Which was incredible. Yeah. Um, so. But still, you know, going through my 20s, I didn't know who I was. Yeah. I was lost. You know, um, I'm trying to come back and play. I'm angry that I did this to myself. I'm trying to figure out um, what it is I want out of this sport. Why am, I, why am I so competitive and lost in this sport? What is this sport doing for me? Um, 
And it, it, it was a painful ride, man, because at the same time, I'm trying to be in a relationship. I mean, I got engaged because I felt like I had lost everything in my life and I wanted to hold on to it. I wanted to bring it closer to me. My, my dad, you know, we had this massive house in North Carolina that my parents rented and I wanted to bring my then fiance down to live with us and my dad says, when you bring it, I'm not taking care of another child. My dad leaves. My mom then calls her parents and tries to talk her parents into not letting her come down. But her parents are a biracial couple that fought through all the chaos back in the 60s and 70s. And they're like, I can't tell my daughter who to love. So then she comes down and she stays with me. My dad leaves, my mom blames her. You, it, we're all still living together. You think about all these different dynamics are occurring while I'm still trying to figure out, I'm barely able to walk, <laughs> you know? Like I'm still trying to learn how to walk again, yet alone run again uh, or, or play basketball again. So that, that journey was, um, was a great journey because like, if I don't go through all that, I don't think I ever lose that ego that I had started to mm. become comfortable with since my freshman year, sophomore year, junior year of college, being a second draft pick. And for anybody that tells you that it doesn't go to your head, I would vehemently disagree with them because it does. Um, the attention that you get for everything you do. Right. If it's, you know, look at, look at like Lonzo Ball or like, you know, like now his brothers are driving around in Lamborghinis, like Crazy. at a formative stage of your life, how does that not, how does that not compromise a little bit who you are, who you want to be? You may think you have the right principles in place, but it inevitably changes you. Yeah. Um, and I was really, I was secluded. Like I cut myself off from the rest of the world because I was embarrassed. Yeah. I didn't want to deal with, if I can't deal with having a conversation with myself, how can I deal with having a conversation with somebody else about what I did to myself? So, you know, when, you, when you're alone, I don't know what happens to you when you're alone, um, but also I start to overanalyze, psychoanalyze, uh, become depressed. I don't want to go outside. I'm wearing velour sweatpants in the heat of North Carolina in the summer is 100 degrees because I don't want people to see my leg. I have a big contraption around my leg. Uh, I'm trying to make love to my fiance. I can't. Mm. Um, like all these different things just beat up your ego. Yeah. So. And probably your view of masculinity about yourself too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, about how, how can I even have a conversation? Here, here's about a view on that. So my fiance at that time knows everything that's going on, but I couldn't have a conversation with her about everything that's going on. Why not? Because I, I would just lose it. I, I would lose it. Um, the one, the one person that you finally feel like you've been able to hold on to, that you have this incredible emotional connection with, that you had treated poorly in your past. Mm. All right. So think about the guilt that led up to this. I had cheated on her multiple times. I had yeah. lied to her. I had played that game um, and been caught a couple of times and. Here she is, still by my side. Wow. And I felt myself changing. But how can I show her that I'm changing when I'm, I'm still, I'm secluded. I'm only around you. I'm not, how will things change when I go back into the regular world? Who will I be? What, ha what happens if I right. accumulate success again? Will I revert back to who I was? Because I missed that attention in time. So you know, all these different things are going on. And it, it was embarrassing for me to even have that conversation yeah. with somebody that I love so much that I just hurt, you know? Um, those are the things that psychologically just broke me that led to, you know, us really not working and, you know, me channeling all my energy and effort into trying to come back and play because I had lost mm -hmm. that and I need to get that back because that's who I was to, you know, going to the Nets to getting hurt and then going to the D League and tearing my hamstring off to lose my coach to, oh. So I, I feel like if I don't, if I don't, and I, I know that's an extreme, but I've, you know, who knows what an extreme situation might be for somebody else or somebody else might yeah. be you just tear your ACL. Um, but if I don't go through that, I never have this awakening or this position in life where I'm doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. It never happens. Yeah. So that inevitably led me to, this all has to happen for somewhat of a reason. Like, because if I don't believe that, then I go down... Dark I, path, I spend the rest, yeah. yeah, the rest of my life in a dark area. Being a victim and 
Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, that's not the sports mentality I have. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I made, I made mistakes, man. Like, I turned the ball over three times. I got into a motorcycle accident. I walk with drop foot. Um, I still have times when it's difficult for me. Mm. And I just, I own it. And it's cool. Yeah. Because I just, it makes me feel more empowered. Wow. Because I'm sharing my vulnerability with everybody and telling you that I'm human just like you. I just wake up every day and I choose to, to fight. Mm. My man. My I brother. like that. I like that. A uh, couple final questions for you. Is there anything you wish your dad uh, would say to you that he hasn't said? Hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that, that scares me is that, you know, when you live in a city, a lot of my friends are already divorced. And it was actually one of the things that inspired me to write my book. A really good friend of mine who was my lawyer, he married his college sweetheart and one day he came home and all of her stuff was just like gone. And she left him for a hedge fund guy and it's the first time I realized, I was like, oh, okay, other people have accidents too. Now, you know, it's not my job to compare my accidents because, mm -hmm. you know, comparison is the thief of joy, mm -hmm. right? But it's also like, all right, like, whether it's your ACL or you lose your wife or you lose your husband or somebody passes away or you lose a child, we all have our own accidents. And with my dad, the thing that scares me about my relationship is that I want to be successful at it. Like I want to, and we talk about this all the time, like who are we surrounding with, who are we surrounding ourselves with in order to have a successful marriage and how do we have open lines of communication? And I don't think I need anything from my father. I think my father, regardless of whether he thought he was or not, his life has served as a compass for me in the way I want to live my life. And I've been able to take the positives and mm -hmm. the negatives and get to this point. But I, I see, I'm a sucker for love, man. I'm a sucker for connections and mm -hmm. I, I don't always, it's hard for me to follow through with everybody, but I will be the first to apologize to somebody about, hey, my schedule's just crazy, and but you have me, like you have all of me. I'm giving you my attention. I wish my father would be able to sit down with my mother and they would come to closure. Mm. They're still married, wow. but they're not married. My dad lives in New Jersey, my mom lives in North Carolina, but they have this incredible love. And, um, you know, I, I went through, when mm. we first came in, I went through a pretty volatile relationship uh, that really opened my eyes to how committed people can be in a very volatile relationship and how that volatility essentially becomes your norm and how people just, because of the deep love they have for each other, they just keep rolling with it. Right. And some people don't address it or some people's ego don't allow them to address it. And they never really come to a conclusion on how to make that work. Now, I, I think, I don't know if my parents have ever came to a conclusion on how to make it work, but I've never seen them address it hmm. directly with each other and hear each other out. And as I get older, I see my mother and how beautiful of a person she is. And my mother has things too like my dad right but they have never been able to hear each other hmm. have you ever tried to facilitate it I, I used to you know um, I used to but I don't I don't think I've taken on the burden of that being my job anymore right right I can't yeah I can't like it, it has to be something that they choose to do sure um, you know a couple years ago I finally chose regardless of whether it led to frustration or arguments on their part I said you know what like I'm doing something for me. I would like to have my family around in a house that I rented out east. And I hope you guys can get along, but I want to have my family around. I'm yeah. going to do something selfish for me because I'm always worried about, well, how's my mom going to go with my dad? How long can they be around each other? And I'm very conscious of it. And it was the first time I was like, you know what? Screw you it. guys can figure it out. Now, it didn't work, but I was still, I was like, you know what? Okay. Like, yeah. all right. It worked for me. Now, it's selfish on my part. But um, I hope that one day they can come to a point where they can have that with each mm -hmm. other. Because I, I someday, you know, um, whether it was the, you know, plus 10 kids that just lost their lives, I think up in Canada, the hockey it's team. The hockey, oh my gosh. Right? It's so sad, man. Or if it's, um, 
we had a guy, his name was David, that used to come over to our house, you know, once a week, and he was our exterminator. And like, I, look, man, like, I don't care what, like, you're a person. Like, I love people. Like, I'm always gonna kick it with anybody. Yeah. Doesn't matter what profession, like, what job you have. And him and I always talk about life and stuff. And then, you know, last week I get a, I get a call from his wife. She leaves a voicemail, and she's trying to find, you know, somebody to help them out with payments. And she's like, you know, David just passed away from a heart attack. And my parents are pushing 70, and I really try to approach my life in this manner. Like, who knows what can happen? Yeah. You know, and we take time for granted all the time. I'll do it tomorrow, or I'll talk to that person when I see them in person. And um, sometimes it's powerful to be able to pick up the phone and call somebody like, you know what? I didn't handle this correctly, or I could have handled this better. Or maybe it's not even saying that. Maybe it's just saying, how do you think I handled that? And I may not agree with you, but just me right. hearing you right. can lead to us being in a better place. Like that's powerful. And I think I wish my parents or people I know would try to do that more. Yeah. That's what I wish. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. You're a very competitive, driven person, very passionate about what you do. Love people, love your work love the mission you're, you're, that you're on in life, and you have, you're about to be married and with a child on the way. And you mentioned before that you have six days a week that's essentially for your career, your businesses, traveling, and one day a week for family, essentially. Which was a problem, Is yes. That this year, yes, this year was a problem. How um, are you going to manage this moving forward with you know, a child on the way, a wife, uh, you know, wants your time and needs you as well. And also this competitive drive to create more and be more and build more. Uh, I've thought about that a lot. And I've made the commitment to myself and to her that I'm flipping the way it works. So I am prioritizing my wife and my child. They are number one. They mm. will be number one. And everything else needs to fall in line where it may. Now, I'm extremely lucky where... The woman who I'm going to marry is patient with me because she's also ambitious and she wants me to be fulfilled and happy. Oh, that's great. But, you know, it, it's weird. Like, doing this stuff within sports, it's cool. It's a, it's a great vehicle to open up doors for conversation. And I truly feel like my purpose is to help people. Mm -hmm. If that's helping people by me telling my story and me being vulnerable with myself on a platform like this, or if it's sitting with other people and helping them navigate their own space. Now, I, I can't, I don't think I have any answers. I don't think, um, you know, I always become a little bit wary and people are like, here's the blueprint, how, here's how it works. Uh, because everybody has their own individualistic blueprint. Yeah. But if you're able to work with somebody and talk through what that blueprint may be, may be or talk through how you plan on navigating that or here are some of the potholes in that journey and how do you deal with it, then essentially you're creating that board. And I mm -hmm. think for um, a lot of athletes or a lot of people, we're all athletes in our own way. Um, in particular, you know, I really appreciate you doing this too about sharing emotion. Like mm -hmm. from the time I've been a little boy, we fall down, we don't cry. Like, or even like what things happen to you psychologically on the court. Like you get frustrated after play. We don't show weakness. You know, you cry after you lose. You don't cry. Like you pick up, you go. Like you. And I think now there's a different time happening within yeah. the world, man. And I yeah. see you preaching it. I try to preach it on my side, like to be consciously aware of your emotion. And it's okay to articulate or convey your emotion. And you should be able to convey your emotion without somebody reciprocating anger. Like somebody should be able to say, okay, I understand how you feel. I never, I never thought about it that way. Right. I hear you. Have you thought about this? I think there's a, I'm trying to create more of those moments within what I do business-wise and how I build out content-wise. I think that's the direction I yeah. wanna go. It's great, it's great. Uh, this is called the three truths. It's a question I ask at the end. Okay, I've never seen this, no, I've never seen Three truths. Um, so imagine it's the last day for you, many years from now. You achieve everything you want. You have the family you want, the career, the businesses. You make the impact on the world the, the, world the way you want to. Everything you wanna do, it happens. But it's the last day and you get to choose the day. You could be. 70, 100, 150, whatever age you're able to be. 
but for whatever reason you have to take everything with you everything you've created your books your work your the videos that are out there about your message it's all got to go with you when you go uh, but you have a piece of paper and a pen to write down the three things you know to be true about all your experiences in life that you'd share with the world these could be your lessons essentially for the world to remember you by. Oh, wow, you're really going deep. <laughs> okay. What would you say that you would write down on this piece of paper? It's the only thing people would be remembered by you as your three truths. Um, in no particular order? No order. I think number, I think something I'm passionate about is uh, I would say number one would be love, man. Like I have, um, I have a deep place in my soul where I love really, really hard, and understand that people will make mistakes, and I still love them. Um, I think that's really important. I I love to love, and I also love to feel love. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a very special mystical thing that that we have a chance to to have um i'd probably say number two would be i tried to do it the right way like i i strived for something bigger than myself and i, I think i owe that to coach k and i mm. i i understand that i'm a work in progress but i think how can I work on me? How can I work on myself and my relationship with my wife? How can I work on my relationship with my child? Um, how can I work on my relationship with my parents, my friends, my job? Um, how can I, I think that's important to me because I think that's what drives me. Yeah. Um, and it's not about, I think all the ancillary stuff will come as long as you try to do right by yourself. You try to do right by you, right? Which I don't think a lot of people I think people try to do right by other people, but you do if you do right by yourself, you will inevitably do right by other people. Right. Um, so I'd probably say that's two. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is hard. Um, and I think the last will probably be, I don't know, maybe I just, the ability to, I think this is with my job and this is what I'm trying to do in this next phase to make people, help people get outside themselves, help people get out of their own way. I uh, was in my own way for a long time and I still have moments where I get in my own way, but I think recognizing that I get in my own way forces me to knock that wall down. And being around people and talking to people every day I feel like that's really why I was left here, man. Mm. Um, I feel like that's a big part of my purpose. And everything that has occurred between my accident, between me, my first relationship with my fiance not working out to you know, falling in love with somebody else very hard again, but being lost in that, mm. um, but still sending her love and positivity to this day and wanting her to do well, but recognizing that wasn't the right fit for me um, to finding my fiance now. And, um, and I have a lot of friends that joke with me about, oh, Jay, you were all over the map and, and you know, you did this and you did that. And I was like, you know what, I was. And that has all led me to this point right now where I feel like because of all that, because of those ups and downs and the laughs and the pain and mm -hmm. the joy and the, the sadness, it's given me perspective. And I hope I am blessed to continue to get more perspective. Yeah. But helping other people gain perspective through my perspective <clears throat> uh, and learning from them is, and I like, I know that I would prioritize that. That would be my wife and my child. Yeah. But I feel like that really, I feel like that's why I'm here, man. That's great. I like those. I hope so. Those are great, man. Um, well, I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Jay, for your ability to come back. You know, you went through this very challenging. I, I think it's harder because you were even that much bigger of a draft pick and bigger attention on you. It's harder for someone like that to come back mm -hmm. than someone who wasn't didn't have the attention or didn't have the limelight like you did. You had much more to lose and you still came back. Uh, not only great in business 
and financially and the success, but as a human being and as a man. So I acknowledge you for becoming a better man. Thank you. And coming back out of that accident and this whole journey that you've had. And I know you're going to be an incredible father for your child, very lucky child, uh, with, a, with a father who has awareness, perspective, and goodness in your heart. So I'm very excited about that child's life. Um, Thank you, brother. Yeah, man. Uh, before I ask the final question, I want to make sure everyone goes and gets the book, Life's Not an Accident. Mm -hmm. Make sure you go pick it up. You can get it anywhere. Came out six years ago. Crazy to think how time flies. But it's powerful. Yeah. Um, and where can we connect with you online or how can we support you right now? Well, I'm in the process of trying to get everything aligned right now. I think I've been uh, a little bit all over the map the last couple of years as far as um, just my online presence and, <laughs> and, and you know, so... You know, I'm at Real J Williams on, on Twitter and, and Instagram. Um, gonna try to create a YouTube channel this summer and start focusing on that, which it's a journey, I, man. I have to pick your brain <laughs> on. It's a journey. Uh, we'll have a lot of conversations <laughs> yes. with you about that. And um, you know, just thrive to try to become the Oprah of the sports world, man. I like it. That's the game plan. That's good. And people can watch you on ESPN during co college, college basketball. basketball. I mean, I'll be on uh, a variety of shows. I'll be on Get Up a lot. Uh, which we just opened a South Street Seaport here, nice. ESPN in New York. So I'll be on that. And that's a new show, right? Get it's up. a new show. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, who's that with Mike and? It's uh, with Mike Greenberg, Jalen Rose, and Michelle Beto. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. So I'll, I'll take some more to roll in that, and uh, yeah, I got some big things on the horizon. I got Best Shot, which is coming out in June, which would be cool. Me working with these kids and yeah. trying LeBron, to push them with the LeBron. Producer yeah, he's on executive it. producer on that's that. Um, yeah, man. Um, I'm coming. It, the train isn't moving it's at coming. warp speed, but it's coming. <laughs> it's moving. It's moving. That's all you can ask for. But if they follow you on Twitter or Instagram, they'll be able to see all this stuff yes, coming out. for sure. Okay, cool. Uh, final question is, what's your definition of greatness? What's my definition of greatness? So I wouldn't equate um, greatness with financial success at all. Um, I always find that interesting when people say, well, you know, you're financially successful. And I'm like, well, I don't deem that as success. Mm -hmm. um, I deem the way I live my life, that's greatness. Like if, if I can thrive for greatness by saying what I'm gonna do and doing it, being there for the people I love, mm -hmm. being a good husband, being a good father. Now, I know those are all roadmaps that sometimes could have potholes, but I think it's, I don't think it's just the word greatness, I think it's Two words added to greatness is thrive for greatness. And if you can have that approach on a daily basis, then if I fall an ounce or two ounces <laughs> below it, I will be in good company. Yeah, of course. Awesome. Jay, sure. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thanks, you. I appreciate it.